Well, we've talked a lot today about transportation here on Earth. But for my next conversation, we're turning to the final frontier. I'm pleased to be joined by Karina Dries, uh, president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. This is new for me. I didn't know we had a Commercial Space Flight Federation. It's very cool. She manages the properties of the Federation's more than 85 member companies and pursues key policy initiatives to spur innovation and advance national space capabilities. Karina, I think this federation is new to you too, right? You're, 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 you're new to this position. So I, just because, I mean, give us a snapshot of how, you know, sorry about, you know, going into William Shatner voice uh, on the final <laughs> frontier. Here, but 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 tell us what you're bringing to the policy world, what the companies that are supporting you are concerned about that they need a federation dealing with our final frontier. Absolutely. So, yes, as you mentioned, uh, the Commercial Space Flight Federation is the leading trade association for the U.S. in terms of space policy and uh, the regulatory environment as well for the commercial space flight industry. And, you know, j I just want to say thank you so much for not only the kind invitation to speak today, but for recognizing that the commercial space sector does play such a critical role in the future of mobility. Well, I think, you know, one of the things, you know, for our audience to understand, I, I think you know, we're hearing more and more about space. We see Elon Musk, we see Richard Branson, we see other players out there. I'm sure there are many other members that don't understand that as you look at space, I've been following some of your tweets, you know, measuring it, knowing it, understanding it. And we just had this controversy over a Chinese uh, satellite or com coming down and crashing near the Maldives and a really strong statement from NASA about China's irresponsibility in this moment. And it kind of made, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you. There's a lot out there that the general person on the street doesn't understand that's happening. Um, how? Big a deal was the was was the China element crashing to the Maldives and and you know as we look at managing space, what are the big things the public needs to know? Absolutely. So that is an important question, and you know as we think about uh, the 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 space environment, it's it's not just a, a U.S. only environment. Right. There are a lot of players in space, a lot of governments that are operating in space. So we do think a little bit about, you know, the international implications of space and what the U.S. can and should be doing to lead in this effort. So, you know, certainly as we think about space travel, certainly um, when we think about humans traveling to space and satellites in space and the fact that, you know, everyday Americans rely on space for just their, their daily lives these days. We use space to go to work. We use space, you know, to even in a virtual environment, we use space to travel. Um, tourism, it plays a huge role, uh, you know, uh, for space as well. So it, it's really important, it's critically important that all nations can uh, take responsibility for their role in space as well. You know, and I have spoken to, you know, some friends of yours in a sibling organization, the Aerospace Industry Association, around, you know, the notion of space. Talk to Ellen Stofan, you know, from the National Air and Space Museum. And they, they share with me that there is like a coming infrastructure in space we haven't fully appreciated yet. Can you share with our audience to the degree that you're able to um, disclose things? What is that going to look like? I mean, are we going to, you know, see Elon Musk satellites every three seconds over our head, you know, going over? I mean, what, what are the dimensions of change we're going to see in the next 10 to 20 years and how we interact with space? So... That's a great question. And when you, certainly when we think about infrastructure, it's everything from the launch pad uh, to the infrastructure that's required for launch to the payloads that we're launching into space like satellites uh, to, you know, in the future in space manufacturing. And it's not that mm. far fetched anymore to start thinking about manufacturing in space and even creating, you know, uh, infrastructure, permanent infrastructure on the moon and, in, and on the future Mars. So it's no longer a far-fetched idea where folks used to think about space as something that was not achievable, not reachable. And certainly when you think about the commercial space sector, uh, that's a foreign concept as well because space has been dominated by governments. And the commercial space companies today are now playing such a critical role in that. So we've got scientists doing experiments on space where we've now provided an opportunity for scientists to be in their ideal lab environment and their microgravity environment. We've got companies that are developing uh, inflatable uh, space habitats for uh, not only scientists, but entrepreneurs to be able to travel to in the future. 
We have companies that are developing reusable vehicles to be able to come, uh, you know, go up and back into space. Uh, so it's it's really across the board, and it's pretty remarkable the advancements that have been made even in the last ten years. Karina, I don't know if this is an out of left field question. I'm going to probably tick off a lot of people that want to go on space flights and space tourism and all of that. Um, but I guess my question is, you know, what we've seen the real revolution is in robotics in composites in designs you know you you just discussed manufacturing in space we just saw in mars you know the first uh, uh flight you know from from the base of mars in there it was sort of the wilbur and orville wright moment for mars uh there and i guess i find myself a little wishy-washy on the issue of why do people need to be in the scene other than designing it why do why do we also need to think about humans in there? Is there not is is not the bigger element of this looking at the advances in robotics and design and communications and 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 all of that and and not spend as much resources thinking about how to you know colonize Mars as Elon Musk has talked about? Right. It's really all of the above. And mm. that is such a remarkable thing about this industry, the commercial space flight industry, because it is everything from launch to satellites, to um, putting you know additional cargo on the International Space Station, to creating new space stations, uh, to building in space. Um, but there's there's a really important human element here. And when the common American thinks about humans in space, it's easy to think about NASA astronauts and how exclusive the astronaut corps is. Hmm. And most people think I could never do that. You know, I, I could never qualify for that. But it's changing and it's changing drastically. You know, there's there's still less than 600 people that have ever been to space. And if you have a conversation with any one of them, they will tell you it's a life changing experience. And that's what a lot of these companies are trying to provide when we start thinking about putting humans into space. It's continuing this step in exploration, um, which is in our DNA. It's part of our core. So absolutely, I do think it's critical that when we think about um, putting assets in space, that we're also thinking about putting humans in space. Now, Karina, you have 85 companies, and I don't want to let this go because it's one of these things because, you know, the folks that you're dealing with, they're engineers, they're STEM, they're advanced to the future, science is so key to this. We've talked a lot about equity, we've talked a lot about inclusion in a lot of shows. Are your companies and membership organization, you know, as a membership organization, committed to finding ways to bring more women, more people of color into this space, which has been mostly white guys? You know, yeah, I mean, I, I hate a, to be so blunt, but I just wonder if it's a if it's on the dashboard. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that really gets me excited about working in this industry is the talent this industry attracts. And it's incredibly diverse um, and it spans generations. So mm. space is one of those things that's very common for all of us to get excited about. And I can tell you, you know, even from personal experience, being in the very rural part of California in the Mojave Desert, when the companies would have uh, various events and activities and fl and uh, flight tests as well, I really took note just looking amongst the the workforce of those companies, how diverse they were, because, it, you know, the rural part of California, you just don't really see that kind of diversity. So it's it's very uh, it's noticed, I think. There are a lot of programs now, fellowship programs that a lot of the commercial space companies and the traditional space companies mm -hmm. as well are leaning on to help uh, inspire young folks to get involved in science and engineering and then ultimately see careers in these companies. So I absolutely see this as an opportunity, not only for you know job creation, but specifically for STEM job creation mm. and to increase diversity in this industry. Before I let you go, Karina, I just got to ask you, um, you were previously the CEO and general manager of the Mojave Air and Space Port. So obviously you're a kind of space obsessive compulsive. How did you get on this track? Like, what's your story? <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, well, I suppose just briefly, as a, as a business school student back in 2005, which is really when the industry was starting to get up and running, uh, Peter Diamandis, who was an MIT alum, actually came out to speak to our class and was talking about the XPRIZE Foundation and how he got started with the XPRIZE. And I was just incredibly inspired and I was hooked at that moment. So I spent my summer internship uh, sleeping on somebody's floor in Santa Monica, California, <laughs> and just so I could go to work at the XPRIZE Foundation. And that was sort of my introduction to the industry. 
And I, I haven't looked back. It's just been so incredible and such an inspiration to be involved in this industry, all the companies that are doing such remarkable things. And, you know, the, the entrepreneurs that are putting their personal wealth um, at stake in this industry as well. It's, it's just, it's so easy to get interested in it. And that's why I think a lot of folks are really interested now in this industry. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that story. It's fascinating. I'm fascinated by XPRIZE. Did not know that background with you, so thank you. Karina Dries, yeah. president of the Commercial Space Light Federation. Thank you so much. I wish you really well uh, with what you're doing as, as we go ahead. I know that Vice President Kamala Harris has you know, responsibility now for, for space work, like Vice President Mike Pence did. I'm sure you're gonna be interacting with um, the Vice President and her team, and we'd love, we'd love to have you back. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation.